You are listening to Climate Now. I'm Catherine Gorman. And I'm James Lawler. And today we're going to dig into the history of climate impact assessment models. We're going to talk about what that means, how we use these models, and how we expect the scenarios that these models produce to actually unfold. That is, what the cost might be to society and sort of other things that these models help us to, to understand. Our guest today is Dr. Yuri Rogel. He's Director of Research and a Lecturer in Climate Change and the Environment at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London. We're very honored to have him here with us today because over the past decade, Dr. Rogel has contributed to several major scientific climate change assessments, informing the international climate negotiations under the UNFCCC, including the annual emissions gap reports by the United Nations Environment Program, the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC special report on the 1.5 degree change of global warming. And big breath, if that was not enough, he is a lead author on the IPCC's sixth assessment. <laughs> Dr. Rogel, thank you so much for joining us today. Very happy to be here, thank you. So Dr. Rogel, let's start with your personal journey. How did you get where you are today? Well, that's uh, quite a long story, to be honest, and uh, I, I will shorten it a bit for, for the sake of having time left to get into the substance. Um, my background, is actually really not in climate change. And it is kind of, a, it, it grew actually very organically. I have a background in uh, engineering. I have a master's in engineering and then I have a master's in development cooperation and anthropology. And uh, when, I, when I finished studying, I went to, to Africa to do a couple of years of uh, development cooperation. And uh, while being there, I kind of got intrigued by climate change. I was doing measurements of, of water, of uh, hydrology, of flows in streams, and I saw that uh, there was little data available and the data that they had was, was really bad and changing. It was already then different from how it was a couple of decades before. And so that really kind of caught my attention. And, um, and so I, I was looking then to go back into academia to, to learn a bit more about this climate change thing. And um, purely by accident, uh, literally through the saxophone player of a band I was playing in into, in, a, in an Italian restaurant in Kigali. I ended up uh, landing a, a research position at uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. It's one of the leading global institutes for climate research. And through another kind of accident, I ended up becoming the scientific advisor to the presidency of the climate change negotiations in 2009 uh, that took place in Copenhagen. Uh, that these, those negotiations were not successful. I do not necessarily take responsibility for that. I really did my best. Um, so uh, as you can see, this can go on for quite a while, but um, after that year, really my interest was peaked. Also particularly my interest was peaked in um, in the negotiations in international climate change. And a key part of understanding uh, those negotiations is to develop pathways of how we can go from where we are today to somewhere in the future where we limit warming to two degrees, 1.5. At that point, it was still two degrees. And so uh, after that one year of, of this deep dive, I started a PhD uh, in Switzerland. Um, after that, I moved on to, a, to another international research institute, in, which is called the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which is one of, the, one, one of the pioneering institutes in global scenario research. And then because of, uh, because of personal choice uh, and because of my, uh, my personal situation, uh, because my wife is from the UK, I moved to the UK. And now I'm here at Imperial College. I don't know if I've ever heard an academic story include being a saxophone player in an Italian restaurant in Kigali, but uh, that is pretty amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it just goes to show how, how, how life can just be a, a sequence of, of random events, and it's, uh, it's for us to make the best of it. So give us a sense of the history here. Can, can you describe how recently we started to see the global community get serious about emissions? We need, we need to understand what serious about emissions means. 
uh, since the 80s, there, there, there was really a sequence of international uh, scientific conferences that really put um, the climate change problem on the map. Um, it was a, there was a conference in 1985 in Villach. There was uh, the first world uh, climate conference from the World Meteorological Organization. Um, and they basically led to um, the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1988. And then after the IPCC uh, published its first report in, uh, in 1990, they led to the creation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This, this convention was adopted in 1992 at the Rio Convention, the, Earth, the, the well-known Earth Summit. And, and that is really the starting point of this international uh, focus on, or the international framework for climate change mitigation or to do something about climate change. Now, I wouldn't say that we really started doing much about the emissions at that stage. Um, then took until 1997 for the Kyoto Protocol to be agreed upon where only uh, developed countries had a, a commitment to reduce their emissions even by a very small degree. And then after that, there has been this continuous um, struggle actually to, to develop a global climate change framework that incorporates commitments by all countries. The first attempt was the 2009 summit in Copenhagen, which was a failure. There, no, nothing really came out of that. The next year in Cancun, uh, this was again set back on track. And then in 2015, during the Paris Agreement, um, a new global, globally encompassing agreement was, uh, was adopted. Now all countries need to, need to contribute to reducing emissions. They all need to contribute within their own means. What the Paris Agreement does is now has put in place an architecture where every five years countries put forward pledges and then they get reviewed. And every five years, it's called the ratcheting process. These pledges are supposed to be improved. And this year is a really important year um, because the climate summit of this year uh, we expect countries to come forward with new and improved pledges. And, um, and I would say that in 2018, we published the IPCC special report on global warming of one and a half degrees. And I feel that at least since then, um, the Paris Agreement has as a, its goal to keep, keep warming well below two degrees and pursue to limit it to 1.5. Um, since that report in 2018, at least the societal conversation has really switched on to aiming to limit warming to 1.5. And in order to do that, emissions need to go down now, literally, um, in order to reach net zero levels by mid-century. So Dr. Rowell, how are these climate projections made in the first place? And how accurate are they? Um, you know, I, I'm wondering if you could maybe walk us through the history of, of making these projections. Um, you know, how they came about to begin with, uh, when we started first using them to inform policy, et cetera? You're totally right. I mean, these projections of climate change, projections of, of basically our society in the future are a key tool for us to understand not just the risks and the dangers, but also uh, the options that we have in, in, in how to deal with it. And um, the historical development of these uh, projections really goes very parallel or hand in hand almost with what I just sketched in terms of the history of the international climate regime. Um, the first really high level scenarios about climate change scenarios were developed in the framework of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change for Climate Change. Uh, in, in the framework of its first assessment report, which was published in 1990, they then published a special supplement that included special scenarios in 1992. And these are really kind of the first attempts for to present policymakers really with different options for the futures where policymakers or decision makers need, need to make decisions about. And um, so starting in 1990, um, it was, these were really um, also acknowledged by decision makers as important tools for their, for their, uh, to inform their decisions. 
And in 2000, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change then created um, a special report, the Special Report on Emission Scenarios, abbreviated SRES. And that report was really kind of a, a major milestone in kind of this entire literature, this entire um, academic field almost for, uh, for emission scenarios. Interestingly, the, the terms of reference for that report, which were defined by the government, explicitly specified that um, the scenarios could explore many futures, but they could not include explicit policies that target climate change. So they could explore how emissions change depending on whether population is higher or lower, whether GDP is higher or lower, depending on which technologies we prefer. But they could not include explicit climate policy. And um, why is this, um, this note important? Because that really um, was a motivation for the climate change community, the research community, to say that doing this within the constraints, the political constraints of uh, an international process is really too narrow for us. So, so the scientific community decided to take this out of the IPCC process and actually develop scenarios, climate change scenarios, as a uh, scientific community in which the, the community can be much more free, any question can be asked, any decision can be taken based on their merit and not necessarily uh, to balance political uh, political difficulties or po political uh, issues. So what were then the developments in the climate science community? In, in 2007, a, um, a framework called the uh, representative concentration pathways was, um, was published. The RCP's uh, representative concentration pathways, they serve a couple of aims. Um, First of all, if, if we think about climate change and climate change research, there are different questions we want to answer. One question that we want to answer is, of course, given these amount of emissions in the future um, and how much warming will we get, given that warming, how, what are the impacts, uh, both physical and socioeconomic impacts? So that is one question. Uh, the other question looks at the other um, at, at, at another dimension, and that is at the mitigation, how do we uh, limit warming to 1.5 to 2 or to 2.5? And, and so what these RCPs try to do is to really bring together this entire community um, around set futures so that studies from different communities could be compared. So that finally, if we want to put all the puzzle pieces together, they, they at least speak about the same things. A future where we limit warming to roughly one, one and a half or two degrees, one where we limit warming to three degrees and one where warming is four or four and a half degrees. So how, how did they do that? With these rep representative concentration pathways, they simply describe concentrations of greenhouse gases for the future. And there were four RCPs initially, RCP 2.6, RCP 4.5, uh, RCP 6, and RCP 8.5. And what do those numbers at the end mean? That is the, the radiative forcing in watt per square meter that, we, that those pathways reach by the end of the century. Just to make sure I'm understanding, when, when you say radiative forcing, what you mean is the amount of energy or watts that's radiating down from the atmosphere on a per square meter basis as a result of the concentration of greenhouse gases that, that resides in the atmosphere. Is that right? Exactly. So uh, to be even more correct, it would be the kind of instantaneous imbalance. So the instantaneous radiation down when you increase the greenhouse gases, after a while, it, it gets into equilibrium when, of course, your temperatures go up. Because as, as your planet warms, it can radiate more energy back into space. And so the imbalance reduces. So again, the sun is, the sun is irradiating the planet. Then there's infrared radiation, which is either hitting the atmosphere or going you know, out into space and being lost. 
But what is hitting the atmosphere and radiating back down onto Earth in the future, the RCPs are identified as either 2.6, 4.5, 6, or 8.5 watts per square meter, depending on you know, how concentrated greenhouse gases are. That's correct. So we, we get, we get short, short wave. So most of it is invisible, not in the visible spectrum or, or, or in the visible spectrum. Uh, so short wave radiation hits our planet. I mean, there's ha there happens a lot in the atmosphere, but most of it uh, or a lot of it hits the Earth's surface. Then it gets radiated back with, um, with infrared or long wave radiation. This actually gets absorbed by greenhouse gas molecules, which then radiate it back in all directions. Some of it is, of course, downward. And, um, and so, yes, that, that downward part is what we refer to as the radiative forcing. Thank you for getting us up to speed with some of our basic climate science. <laughs> and in these RCP scenarios, Dr. Rogel, what are the inputs and outputs you know, for, for those, the model? So uh, for the RCPs, the RCPs are basically a fixed set of pretty much lines of how CO2 concentrations change in the future, methane concentrations change in the future. So only that, that are the RCPs. And that is kind of the central puzzle piece with which two very different communities then run their own models to, for example, understand from these concentrations, what does my climate model tell me will the warming be? And then uh, another community says, okay, if I take these concentrations, what will the warming be? And what, how much will crop yields uh, be reduced because of that warming? At the same time, so, so it's really just one puzzle piece. It's basically a, um, a shared set of assumptions, very narrow, only describing how the atmosphere of our planet changes. So it's really just using this radiative forcing number as a proxy for greenhouse gas concentration. But what does, say, the RCP 2.6 scenario tell us about what's going to, to, what it's going to take to achieve those goals? With 2.6 watt per square meter at the end of the century of the RCPs, they tell us absolutely nothing about what needs to be done to achieve this. They are the incentive for research teams to try and figure out how they can, with their energy system models, which means that it's the model that looks at how um, our power plants and how our transport system and our buildings can transform and change over time, how they can change over time so that emissions are low enough so that ultimately at the end of the century, we get that 2.6 watt per square meter. The RCPs don't provide any information about that but the literature around them that uses them as kind of as benchmarks um, provides that information and provides a richness of information. Got it. Thanks for the clarification. And so how exactly are these RCP scenarios calculated? Basically one of those, uh, what are called integrated assessment models is basically an energy system model that kind of describes how our society changes and how much emissions are produced. They run, a scenario that produces emissions. Then these emissions are run through a simple climate model to see how what the concentration, what concentrations they imply and what radiative forcing that implies. And then once that pathway uh, meets the criteria, for example, 2.6 watt in, in 2100, the criteria that they set themselves, basically all the information about the energy system, about even about the emissions is just cut away and only the pathway of concentrations is kept. And this is kind of done the central puzzle piece. Now let's turn to a related subject. How are the RCP scenarios then tied to this concept of shared socioeconomic pathways? I often hear them referred to as SSPs. I, I arrived at the RCPs, which, uh, so that was in 2007. The next important step, however, the next uh, innovation in how the scientific community looks at, at our future and tries to kind of structure where our planet could be going is by a concept of uh, what they call shared socioeconomic pathways. Basically what this means is the, um, the RCPs just describe how concentrations in the atmosphere change over time, but they don't necessarily describe how our society changes, how socioeconomics change over time. And 
socioeconomics, our societies can change drastically. Um, they can become more inclusive or they be can become more unequal. They can become, uh, they can start to care about the environment or they don't care about the environment. If we want to understand how we reach a, one certain RCP, how we reach one certain pathway of, of, of concentrations in the atmosphere, you can imagine that if, if you ask uh, five, five research teams to tell you how to do it, they come up with five different ways with very different assumptions. Some of them will assume, um, again, that, that uh, the world is very collaborative. Other, others will assume, oh, let's, uh, well, the, three years ago, we would, we would assume, oh, the, the US is going their own way. They are not collaborating globally. Today, we are assuming, oh, the US collaborates globally. Um, so that means that you get this wide variety of, of assumptions and all these scenarios become really hard to compare and they become really hard to compare and connect again to, um, to research that then looks at the impacts because impacts um, depend on not only the hazard or the physical uh, impacts that we see, but also the exposure of populations um, if a if if a flooding event or if, if if some somewhere floods and nobody lives there or there is no infrastructure well then the impact is relatively low if there are people there then then we have an impact in addition it also depends on the vulnerability of that population there if you have a population if there is a flooding event but but people um, live in well protected areas with with, with a barrier uh, well, then we have no, um, then we, so they have low vulnerability and the impact again is lower. So all these, all these questions critically determine the outcome of your study. And so they need to be understood and they need to be, you need to compare like with like. And that is really what this next scenario um, framework then try to do. They try to structure the future in five different worlds. And those five different worlds, they span two dimensions. One describes challenges to mitigation. A high challenge to mitigation is, for example, a society with high population growth, high energy demand, and high reliance on fossil fuels. That's obviously that in such a world, it is really hard to decarbonize. A world with low, Challenges to mitigation is a world that uh, is a very cooperative world that has relatively low population growth and where uh, renewable energies develop rapidly. So that is the dimension challenges to mitigation. Challenges to adaptation can be imagined in the same way. The vulnerability of people critically defines how, how many impacts we will see. Challenges to adaptation can best be imagined. If you have lots of uh, very poor and vulnerable pe people, your challenges to adaptation are much, uh, are much higher. If you have lots of uh, corrupt uh, countries with, uh, with very weak institutions, adaptation is much harder to achieve. And so within, those, within that space, uh, there are five SSPs, shared socioeconomic pathways, basically five narratives, five stories, of how our future can develop. What are these narratives? Can you describe how the five stories were created and, and what they mean in terms of how we might expect society to evolve? So what, what are ultimately these different um, stories? Well, there, there are five of them, which, which are often known by their, uh, by, by their numbers, one, two, three, four, five, but they also have kind of acronyms. Let's simply start with, um, with SSP1. And if you, if you imagine yourself kind of the, the again, this two dimensional space with challenges to mitigation and challenges to adaptation, SSP1 is the one closest to the origin, low challenges to mitigation and low challenges to adaptation. This is a world where global society increases its concerns or where there's an increased concern for the environment uh, in the global society, where there's also an increased international collaboration and where there is a reduction of inequalities both within countries and between countries. And that um, reduced inequality and cooperation between countries combined with um, high educational attainment uh, and therewith lower fertility rates 
in developing countries leads also to lower uh, population growth. Not because it was targeted explicitly, but because as a side effect of better education, better life prospects, and so on. In such a world, uh, so not only is climate change easier because people care about uh, climate change mitigation easier because people care about it, because uh, there is lower population and, and thus lower energy use, but also in a world that is very collaborative, or in a world that is collaborative and where there is higher education, we ex expect technological progress to be relatively high. And also that, of course, helps us to solve this massive problem that we have in front of us, and that is how do we transform our, our society not to produce any greenhouse gases anymore or not to, dump, or to, dump, to not dump them in, in our atmosphere anymore. On the adaptation side, um, richer, better educated uh, and, and less in unequal societies typically deal better with, uh, with, ad, with, with shocks and are more resilient. And, there, and thus also there, the climate change um, adaptation challenges are low. So that was relatively long. So in the next ones, I, I will kind of pick off these to kind of just show the contrast. So that, this was SSP1, sustainability. Let's now jump to, the to, the, to actually the polar opposite, high challenges to mitigation, high challenges to adaptation. This is called um, SSP3 which is called a, uh, a rocky road. What, what the story is there is that this is a world with increasing inequalities, with increasing nationalism, uh, strongly reliant on fossil fuels as, as its technologies, um, where because of low educational attainment, uh, fertility rates remain high. So you have high, uh, large amounts of very poor populations globally. Um, and with, which then have knock-on effects on land use protection and so on. You can easily imagine that in such a real world uh, where you have very weak institutions, lots of poor population, an uneducated uh, global society, it is really hard and challenges to both adaptation and mitigation are really high. The two off-axis worlds are, are kind of a bit the quirky ones that, 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 that are harder to imagine. Uh, An SSP5 is the world where we have high, high challenges to mitigation, low challenges to adaptation. What does that mean? It's basically a, a, a super rich world that focuses fully on fossil fuels, that doesn't try to limit its energy. It just kind of, it, it's called uh, taking the highway. It just full throttle, uh, economic development trumps everything, is, is the most important thing. People are rich, but just because of, we, because of the fact that we use so much energy, that most of our technologies are fossil-based, um, it provides really high challenges to, uh, to mitigation while having low challenges to adaptation uh, because we have a rich and, um, and relatively equal society. Then going to the other side, uh, SSP4 is called inequality. It's an interesting one because it, in my opinion, it's not so far from where we might be heading currently. It is basically an, a very unequal society that where, at, where the elite cares a lot about the environment. Well, we know because it is very unequal, uh, it, there is still relatively high population growth. Uh, there are still important shares of the population that are poor and vulnerable and so that are very can be very exposed to climate change and, and thus adaptation challenges are high. Um, at the same time, because there is this awareness in that world about the environment, the mitigation challenges are relatively low. And then SSP2 ultimately is the easiest one. It's middle of the road. It's just in the middle there between the, those four other dots. And it's basically a... Um, a continuation of historical societal dynamics. So uh, inequality increases or decreases depending on where you are uh, in line with what we have experienced over the past couple of decades. So one follow-up question to these scenarios and the logic of their framework. In 2020, I think we've seen how susceptible humans are to large-scale unexpected changes 
And these changes are not only due to the, you know, the external factors like pandemics, but also, you know, human activity, changes in culture and intellectual thought, <laughs> wars. So how do the five SSP scenarios take into account events that cause major shifts in human behavior? That's a really good point. And I think it is important to understand that these five worlds are constructs that were built on a, in a certain point in time. And at that point in time, that community considered them to be kind of a fair range for the futures that should be explored. At that time, SSP1 was considered to be extremely, extremely ambitious. I mean, all of they're ambitious in, 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 the, in, in their own ways. But um, SSP1 was considered to be in terms of environmental awareness, was considered to be really the, the lowest end that could be considered. But meanwhile, and that is just uh, less than half a decade later, now there are already studies out there that show scenarios or descriptions of the future that are even more ambitious than that SSP1 world, than that sustainability world that was imagined in the mid 2010s. And so that really shows that this framework is actually in, in constant motion and really needs to, uh, needs to evolve together with how society evolves. Uh, one, of, one of the things that are maybe a bit more out there, but is also not included in the framework, is that all of those uh, worlds, in all of them, they, so they assume um, economic growth. Whereas now, in the past couple of years, there has been uh, an increasing literature talking about degrowth uh, or, or maybe not necessarily putting economic growth above anything, everything else. And so I can well imagine that in future reincarnations of this framework, so those dimensions will be added as an additional dimension to the futures that are being explored. One aspect that I haven't really explained is that you have these five, now with the SSPs, these five worlds, but in none of those stories, climate change mitigation is prescribed. And why is that? That is because climate change mitigation is a third axis in this framework. So you have challenges to mitigation, challenges to adaptation, and then in each of those worlds, researchers try to understand what would emissions be if we don't do anything on, on climate policy, and what are, is the deepest level of emissions reductions that we can achieve. Yeah, and we get really interesting insights out of that, actually. Um, for example, I think one of the most important insights is that in SSP3, this uh, very this, this world that is very unequal and where uh, countries revert to kind of their nationalist reflexes and so on, and where there's little international collaboration, even if we try to reduce emissions in that world, scientific research groups or, or we researchers are not able to find solutions. We don't find ways of doing that because simply we cannot imagine in such a world how technologies would uh, would ever develop, the technologies that are needed would develop how the international collaboration that is needed would develop how the land use protection that is needed would actually be enforced if you don't have institutions. So in those, in those worlds, in an SSP3, we even don't find, find pathways that limit warming to two degrees, let alone 1.5, of course. So I'm curious how countries are using these SSPs and RCPs, you know, to, to what extent is the international community actually using these models to shape policy? A lot of the literature that uses the, the SSPs now, which let, let's just talk about those, which, which are kind of extensions of, of or kind of the new, the new version of the RCPs. Um, or the, the most common way that they are used is when that literature is assessed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For example, in the 1.5 report, um, we indicated that to limit warming to 1.5, emissions by 2030 should be reduced uh, 45 to 60 percent with a median of, of 50 percent so halving by 2030 and should reach net zero by 2050 well actually do those benchmarks emission benchmarks over time are from those based on scenarios developed with the ssps um, and so it's clear that countries will use them as benchmarks not only for their emissions or for global emissions but maybe also to see and understand which technologies would would start to scale up over time. 
At the national level, uh, they are also used in, in more sophisticated ways where uh, countries try to understand what the different options are and how the future can look very different depending on which SSP they are that is followed or which SSP the world follows. And so also there it can be used to, to understand kind of transition risks or, or to hedge risks for investments. So you can design investments um, that basically are valid in all the SSPs and not just in one very specific limited context. So really any investment framework should have some kind of model that is tied to these SSPs because the way the world evolves is going to be very different depending on which SSP we happen to manifest. So when we're wondering, you know, should we deploy capital on a longer scale time horizon, there should be analysis done for each of these scenarios, right? Yes, yes and no, and even more, I would say. Uh, so again, the SSPs were designed with one purpose in mind, and that is to bring together the, the, the scientific research community. And, and they, they, they did a good job. They really thought of, of how, for example, education can differ, how GDP growth can differ and so on. But I would say if you do investments, definitely just having one view of the future doesn't, won't provide you with a, with a good and robust investment portfolio. Using the SSPs could provide a good framework, but even better is to use those SSPs as a start, just because there is a lot of literature and information about it but then really make your own informed decisions about what do you think will educational attainment be over the next 20, 30 years. And it's clear that this is just looking into a crystal ball, but you can maybe do it a bit more informed and being aware of the fact of, of, the, of the wide variety of futures that we can have really helps de designing kind of robust portfolios. The SSP framework can there be a good starting point to think about it, the conceptual framework. Dr. Robel, thank you so much for your time today. It's really fascinating. There's just so much going on in these conversations. And I feel like I, I feel like I have a better understanding of all these pieces and how they work together. Now. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Robel. You're welcome. Really, really thank you for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure. That is it for this episode of the podcast. You can check out our other interviews, watch our videos, and sign up for our newsletter at climatenow.com. And if you want to get in touch, email us at contact at climatenow.com or tweet at us at we are climate now. And we hope you'll join us for our next conversation. <laughs>